Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Jamie Knight, and this is part of the BIPOC virtual open print studio program that's been funded through the um, the Creative Citizens in Action at CCA. Um, and I want to thank that um, program for uh, supporting this lecture series, um, as well as the print media program, who has also been helping with this. So today we have Aaron Coleman, um, and I want to welcome him. And Aaron is a DC born and Tucson based artist and educator. He is an assistant professor of art at the University of Arizona. And he received his BFA from Heron School of Art and Design in DeKalb, Illinois, and his MFA from Northern Illinois University. Aaron is a mixed media artist and printmaker whose work focuses on political and social issues. He uses printmaking, painting, collage, and sculpture and installation to create works that address how mundane and seemingly anodyne artifacts embody the complex and pervasive history of race and racism and class and classism in the United States. The objects in his work, picket fences, coloring books, embroidery, and pop cultural ephemera are recontextualized in order to foreground their interactions, both past and present in this history. Aaron has exhibited internationally and received numerous awards, scholarships, and fellowships for his work in lithography and mesotint. Aaron's work can be found in the collections of the University of Colorado, Wichita State University, the Inotro Paper Museum in Kochi, Japan, uh, the Yekaterinburg Museum of Art in Yekaterinburg, Russia, and the University of Tennessee Knoxville Ewing Gallery, among many other public and private collections. I was lucky enough to meet Aaron when we sat together on a panel at the Utopian Studies Conference in 2019, I believe, spring, um, in Berkeley, California. So um, thanks for doing this so much, Aaron. I'm really excited to see your work and I'll just pass it off to you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jamie, for the introduction. Um, I, I'll just going off of what Jamie just said, I will say that the, the panel discussion uh, at the Society of Utopian Studies of Berkeley really kind of reshaped uh, my lecture and the way I give my talk. So uh, you're going to see the, the effects of that here. Um, I am going to share my screen in a second, but I kind of like seeing the little boxes uh, before I start. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about how I approach the work I make. I'm gonna talk about the way I see the world and, and why I see it that way uh, to kind of give some grounding for the kind of imagery that I create, why I create it. Um, and then I'll move into some more of the sculptural installation uh, kind of work. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about process. So if anybody has questions about process particular to the printmaking works, uh, please, you know, ask those questions uh, in the Q&A and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. How's that look for everybody? Good, somebody give me a thumbs up, yeah? Okay. Um, so I like to start with this image uh, it, it maybe seems a little goofy to start with an image of my parents in a lecture, uh, but these two people are, are largely responsible for the kind of character uh, that I hold today, the, the person that I am today, the morals and values that I adhere to, uh, and also the things that I'm interested in. Uh, my father, William Coleman, uh, was born in 1938. So, uh, you know, in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, my mother, my mother was born in 47. So you can kind of imagine the, the things that they lived through, the things that they uh, bore witness to. Um, civil rights movement, various wars, uh, civil unrest, major changes. Uh, and, and through that, they really instilled in me uh, a life of kind of tolerance and acceptance and embracing uh, you know, different di people from different backgrounds. Uh, so they're very, very important to who I am uh, now as a person and as an artist. Oh, I can't click the 
do it that way. Um, this is a <laughs> this is an image of my twin sister and I. Uh, we had a pretty strong bond growing up. I will say that I also have uh, three other sisters and four older brothers. Um, and and for my sister and I, growing up was pretty awkward. You know, being being biracial uh, it puts you kind of between two worlds, right? Neither black nor white, but but understanding the kind of history and the contention between those two backgrounds. Uh, and so, you know, I, I throughout my life had uh, white girlfriends who, you know, one in particular whose parents told me that the red birds don't mix with the blue birds. Uh, another one took me down into their basement to show me a photograph of black children being pressed up against a chain link fence with a fire hose and it said last one over the fence is a nigger. Um, I had black peers uh, in school who, you know, called me names like Oreo uh, or half breed. And so growing up biracial is a very tricky position to be in because you're constantly trying to figure out where you fit in, where you belong, uh, and, and, and different parts of your, your identity. It's, it's, it's not an easy way to grow up. Um, luckily, I had four older brothers, two of which kind of raised me under the umbrella of hip hop. Um, and, you know, hip hop has these kind of four main pillars of MCing, DJing, breakdancing, and graffiti art. Uh, and so these kind of facets of hip hop become really important to me uh, and the way that I start to view the world. So this here is Africa Bambata, who is kind of widely regarded as the godfather of hip hop. Uh, he's one of the first DJs to start sampling music from other genres to create new musical compositions. So Africa Bambata is taking sounds from the disco era and chopping them up and, and scratching the records uh, isolating the breaks to play only the drums and putting other sounds on top of those drums. And if you ever wonder where the term break dancer comes from, it comes from the people at these parties who would dance to the, the drum breaks in a disco song. Uh, and that comes directly from the parties that Africa Bambata would throw. But more importantly for me is this person as kind of a, a cultural figure uh, or even a cultural shapeshifter uh, in some regards. So here you see him uh, wearing this like Viking hat with this kind of biker jacket with metal studs all over it uh, and these big gold rings. And so he's not just mixing genres of music uh, sonically, he's, his outward appearance is kind of a mashup of cultures and different eras in history. So here he's wearing the kind of uh, the head ornaments of, of an Egyptian uh, uh, pharaoh uh, he's got the pyramid around his neck. He's got this kind of gold NASA safety blanket uh, on as a, um, a cape uh, with the, with the Afrocentric uh, beadwork on the necklace and the, and the mask there. So, you know, for me, this is really exciting as a kid because I'm seeing this person um, start to sm smash together different cultures and different kinds of imagery and fashion. Uh, and so, you know, as I was trying to figure out who I was and where I belong, this person spoke to me in a way that said, you might belong wherever you want. You might belong everywhere. You might be able to pull from wherever you want to, to formulate your identity, right? Your identity is shaped uh, and shifting always. It's not set in stone. Uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. I mean, these guys just look insane. And, and so one thing you have to think about is the time in which these, these guys were, were doing their thing. And so it's the late 70s, early 80s, they're in New York. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest time to exist in New York for a black man or black person in general. Uh, and so that here they are trying to, to carve out a space for themselves. They're trying to create something that hasn't been done before. Uh, and so you know, I, I just find this really fascinating. This image here, uh, the, the caption is what I really love about this image. It says, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five would live to regret firing their stylist. Um, I wanna go back to Africa Bambata real quick because I think it's, it's important to point out 
that this, this guy isn't just a cultural icon, but he was also responsible for um, giving the inner city youth in New York a safe place to express themselves. And so Africa Bambata created what's called the Zulu Nation. Uh, and you may have heard of a tribe called Quest or De La Soul or KRS-One. All of these kind of groundbreaking culture creators were part of the Zulu Nation. And Africa Bambata's goal was to prevent inner city youth from joining gangs uh, like the Black Spades Gang at the time. Uh, so you may have heard the phrase, the Bronx is burning. Well, during this time you had um, landlords burning down their, their buildings for the insurance money. And so you had these kind of dilapidated buildings all, buildings all over Brooklyn and uh, you know, gangs were moving into them, junkies were, were taking up residence in them. And there was a lot of pressure on inner city youth to join these gangs to sell drugs out of these buildings. So you know, this, this is a very important figure uh, to me. Uh, so I'm going to play a little audio sample for you here, uh, and it's going to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about when I talk about this musical mashup. Um, so the first sample you're going to hear is uh, a sample from the 50s from a, an artist named Doris Day, and then you're going to hear a sample uh, from an artist named The Wax Taylor from 2012, where he's kind of borrowing the Doris Day sample and shifting it. And, and I will say that sampling now is, is not a new thing, right? You're all probably aware that music uses samples, but when I was growing up, this was still a very um, kind of groundbreaking practice. Hey, set up, set up. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Okay, set up. Said I, what will be, will be. And now the moment we've been waiting for is here. I, I have something to tell you. So that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of what's happening in hip hop music. Um, for me, this was kind of earth shattering, right? I could hear the, the soul and the jazz and the blues that my father was listening to uh, mixed together with the, the pop or the classic rock or the folk music that my mother was listening to. And it was all put together in this new package. Uh, and so you know, another really amazing thing about this kind of music and this ability to pull from the past and bring it back to the present um, is that Doris Day is singing this song in the 50s. And so today, there's a lot of people on the planet who will never be exposed to that song or the artist known as Doris Day. And by Wax Taylor bringing that uh, back into a new musical composition, not only is he creating something new, but he's offering Few, you know, current generations access to something they may not have had access to before. So here's an image of me performing. Uh, there's my, my favorite old dirty bastard t-shirt that my dog ripped up 10 years ago. I miss that shirt dearly. Um, music was, was a huge part of forming who I am and, and the way I see the world. So the same way that these, these DJs and producers were pulling from music and different genres, um, I started to move through the world thinking how I could kind of piece together who I am, how I can piece together my identity uh, and the work that I do. Um, and so I mentioned those kind of four main pillars of hip hop and graffiti being one of those. Um, I, you know, I painted trains and bridges and walls for a long time uh, and this particular mural on this day, uh, I was painting with some of my friends 
and there were some kids in the neighborhood and they would often come up to the wall and ask us, you know, can you paint my dog's name on the wall or can you, can you like put my portrait on the wall? Uh, and so we would entertain those, those requests. Uh, it, was, it was fun to have the neighborhood kids around. Um, but on this particular day, uh, we asked them what they, what they wanted us to paint. And, and one of them said, Aqua Teen Hunger Force. And so we put these Aqua Teen Hunger Force characters in the mural. Uh, and it's all good and fun. And, and we were having a blast doing it. Uh, but looking back on this now, what's particularly interesting to me is that we were kind of directly reflecting the neighborhood that we were living in back onto itself. So painting the cracked sidewalks, the boarded up windows, the uh, busted parking meters and the steel garage doors that covered the windows to businesses so that they couldn't be broken into. Um, you know, we're, we're in our late teens, early twenties when we're painting this. So we're not 100% consciously aware of this political kind of gesture uh, but when I look back on it now, it's hard not to see that, right? We were directly representing the landscape that we were a part of. And in that way, we're kind of borrowing the landscape uh, to shift the message that it's projecting, right? So we're, we're, we're creating a new message. We're taking back public space. Um, and I see that very much in line with appropriating a musical sample or appropriating an image. Right, we're appropriating the landscape to to recontextualize it for ourselves and for other people. So, um, I <laughs> I decided that I was sick of running from cops. Um, I decided that I was sick of you know climbing up the sides of billboards and jumping off of rooftops and and all that kind of crazy stuff. It was super fun, but I wasn't very good at it. Uh, and so I, for some reason, decided to go to art school. Uh, and I did, I, I went to, to Heron uh, for undergrad. Uh, it took me longer than four years to get out, but that's okay. Uh, and then I ended up in grad school at, at Northern Illinois University. And my, you know, my thinking changed, my work changed. And up to this point, I wouldn't even say that I was making, you know, quote unquote work, but when I got to grad school, the kind of the 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 level changed, right? It, there was this sense that I, I needed to take this seriously. There was a sense that I needed to make work that people would take seriously, and so I started producing work like this. Uh, it was introspective. It was uh, deep, you know, with more air quotes. Um, it's what I thought folks would take seriously, and. I was talking to one of my mentors who was a really amazing mentor, but particularly honest and harsh. And he, you know, he said things like, you know, this work is contrived, it's predictable. Um, but the most important thing that he said to me or asked me rather was, where are you in this work? And in, in the moment, I thought, oh, that's a really dumb question because I'm right there. Like that, that is me, that's a picture of me. Um, and he didn't, he didn't find that amusing. And, and I realized what he meant was, where are your guts? Where are your lived experiences? Where is all of the things that you've been through in your life or all the things you care about? How can you put that into the work? And so that, that was a really kind of uh, pivotal moment for me. It really changed the way I thought about art school. Um, and it changed the way I thought about the experiences that I had had and how they could impact the work that I make now. Um, so right after that, I, I shifted gears pretty drastically. Um, so this piece here uh, is a first for me in a lot of ways. It was the first time that I, I start using text in my work and the text uh, could be seen as a hangover from painting text on walls uh, or as kind of influenced by texts that I was writing when I was making music, uh, writing lyrics. Um, it's also the first time that I use comic book imagery in my work. And that, that comes from my interest in what might be considered low brow, right? Graffiti and pop culture, street culture uh, was something that up until this point, I didn't think would be taken seriously, even though it was a major part of my life experience. Um, and so here you have an image of Superman and it's, it's from the death of Superman graphic novel. 
uh, when he's just been defeated by Doomsday. Um, and you can kind of see him looking down diagonally to the right. Um, and the text says that's not exactly how his powers work. Um, so this, yeah, this image is pretty, pretty important to me. Uh, the more I use the comic book imagery, the more I wanted to have kind of a counterpart. So if I had a comic book character playing the hero, I didn't necessarily want a comic book character playing the villain. Uh, I wanted to be a little more deliberate in my choices. Um, and I should also just point out that I am appropriating imagery, right? Because that's kind of how my mind is, has been molded over, you know, my entire life is uh, piecing together things from what already exists to make something new. Um, and so as I'm looking for these counterparts, I, I, I come to these photographs of stained glass windows and I'm lucky enough to have traveled quite extensively throughout my life uh, with my parents and also just kind of in general by myself. Um, and I've always had an affinity for cathedrals and churches. Uh, and anytime I travel, I do go to churches. I'm not a particularly religious person, but uh, there's something about the way they smell, the way they look, the way they sound. Um, it's, it's a, it can be a really impactful place. Uh, and what I realized is that um, the stained glass windows are kind of the comic book of the religious world. You have these bold graphic outlines, these simplified forms, idealized figures, bright colors, uh, stories of kind of good and evil or, or morality. Um, and so it only made sense to me to use these images in concert with the comic book imagery uh, to start telling stories. Um, and the stories that I'm telling are about current events at the time, uh, but they're also old stories that I'm kind of uh, modifying or twisting to either reveal a truth that's been hidden or comment on how the past connects to the present or the future. Um, and so this piece in particular is called Atkins Annunciation. And I don't know how many people would remember um, Todd Atkins, which was a, he was a Missouri Senator. And he's the person who coined the term legitimate rape. And what he meant by that was um, when a woman is raped, if she conceives, if she has a child as a result of that rape, it must not have been a legitimate, a legitimate rape because the female body, quote unquote, has the ability to shut that whole thing down. And, and what he's saying is that biologically, the female body has the ability to know when it's being accosted uh, and, and to make alterations uh, genetically to not, not become pregnant. And this is all stemming from Todd Atkins' uh, very conservative Christian point of view. And this is a senator with a lot of power, a lot of influence. He's making political decisions for giant groups of people. Um, and so it's a very troubling thing to hear someone like that say. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of comment on that. And so what you have here is sort of a retelling of the Annunciation where this angel comes down to the Blessed Virgin and tells her that she's going to you know, uh, have this child uh, and, and you know, it's referred to as immaculate conception, right? There's no explanation for it. And so here instead you have the Blessed Virgin who has been overlaid with an image of Lois Lane and Lois Lane is being pressed up against the wall. Uh, you can kind of see the main hand in that graphic image is actually holding her hand and twisting it backwards. Uh, and then the angel is here uh, prepared to pierce the Blessed Virgin uh, with a harpoon. So, you know, my, my interest is really in uh, being critical of the role of the church in some of these decisions or their, their inactivity in, in some of these decisions that are made on behalf of millions of people um, that really negatively impact um, those people. Uh, this image here is titled Bundle of Joy, Bundle of Sticks. Uh, Bundle of Joy, of course, being a baby. Bundle of Sticks being the original kind of definition of the term faggot. Uh, and so here you have this, this father figure who is placing his bundle of joy turned bundle of sticks 
into a fire. Uh, and, and this piece stems from my relationship with uh, a peer in graduate school. And this person was a Mensa award winner, uh, exhibited all across the world. And, and I just wanna remind you that we're in grad school at this point. Uh, this person is exhibiting all over the world. This person received their, their MFA and then went on to get a second master's degree in education from Harvard uh, and is now a Harvard fellow. And so despite all of those accolades, despite um, you know, being what uh, uh, you know, the average bear would consider to be an upstanding citizen, uh, a good person, a successful person, someone who works hard, all those kind of qualities that we look for in people uh, her, her parents um, disowned her due to her sexual orientation. And I remember being in the studio one day and listening to a phone conversation that she was having with her sister, negotiating the terms of her being able to see her sister's new baby. Uh, and so I made this piece about that, that experience, about that story. Um, and yeah. Um, I'm going to jump to this image, um, but I think it's important that I point out that that up until this point, the work that I'm making is about oppressed communities of which I do not necessarily belong to, right? I'm talking about women's issues. I'm talking about issues that impact the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and for me, it, it took a very long time for me to come to terms with why I was making this work uh, and why I wasn't making work that directly had to do with my lived experiences. You know, why was I looking outward rather than inward? Um, and it's, it's more recently become clear to me that when you don't have a community that knows where you come from, when you don't have mentors that understand who you are or the implications, uh, you know, the, 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 the repercussions of your skin color in this world or, or your, you know, the, the issues you might deal with um, as a non-binary person. Uh, when you don't have that kind of relationship, it's very difficult to process the things that you experience. It's even more difficult, at least for me, to put those things out into the world. So I'm saying this in a very convoluted way uh, because it's a sensitive topic, but I never had a black professor. I never had a black teacher. Uh, the only mentor I had that was black was my father. And so I didn't know how to dig into issues that I was dealing with or living with. Um, and it wasn't until I got older uh, that I was able to start really kind of pulling those things apart. Um, and so you're seeing huge gaps here in the work, but that's just because I'm, I'm trying not to take up five hours of your time. Um, this image here is really important and, and, and changed kind of the way that I think about my work. I was on my way to France for a residency at Atelier Le Grand Village, and I had worked on some sketches um, that I thought I was gonna produce while I was at this residency. But a couple of things happened simultaneously that really shifted my plans for the work I would make there. Um, first of all, when I got there, uh, I, I went to some of the, the antique shops and I was confronted with a couple of things. One, I was confronted with a lot of Mickey Mouse comic books, a lot of vintage Mickey Mouse comic books. Um, and, you know, there's this, there's this history of Walt Disney, uh, being an anti-Semite and employing anti-Semitic uh, employees. Um, and so I was, I'm always aware of that history behind Mickey Mouse. And so I, I, I gravitated towards those comic books. Um, but what really struck me was the white gloves. And I'm interested in these white gloves as kind of a symbol or like a hypocritical symbol for purity and whiteness. Um, I think about when someone would uh, put on a white glove and wipe their finger across the surface and then look at their finger to see if it was dirty. Uh, I think about the old soap advertisements where you'd have a white child and a black child standing in a wash bin and the white child would be 
uh, scrubbing the black child's skin with soap and underneath his black skin would be white skin. Uh, so implying that something other than white is impure or is dirty. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that I was confronted with were these porcelain figurines. So this residency is just outside of Limoges, which is known for its, its porcelain. There's a major porcelain factory there. Um, they're known around the world for their porcelain. And in these uh, antique shops were these porcelain minstrel figures. And what struck me about these porcelain minstrel figures, one is that they're still available, that people haven't smashed them to bits or taken them off the shelves. Uh, but maybe more surprisingly is that on the bottoms of them was the stamp 2015. So somebody had recently made them or stamped them to you know, look like they were recently made. Um, and so that was very perplexing to me. Um, so the, those images were really kind of embedded in my mind. But maybe the most important thing that happened uh, was Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. That happened right when I, when I got there. Um, and so I kind of, it, it was codified in my mind. It was made very apparent if it wasn't already <clears throat> that as soon as a black person steps out of the role of service or entertainment or um, uh, less than a second tier status, uh, they're ostracized, they're, they lose their job, they're imprisoned, they're beaten by police, they're tased. Um, you know, he, Colin Kaepernick is protesting police brutality by taking a knee, in, in this peaceful act, and he lost his livelihood, right? He, 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 was, he left the game, he was kicked out of the game, uh, all for, you know, both literally and figuratively refusing to play ball. So um, these images really came about out of a cacophony of, of influences, um, but they're really important for my work going forward. Um, <clears throat> so this is a quote uh, from uh, Race, the Floating Signifier by Stuart Hall. And it says, science, anthropology, and religion fix and secure human differences in a natural form. Uh, and the idea here is that there are various authoritarian systems of power in place that we historically put our trust in, right? If something is proven by science, the majority of us will believe it because we, we, we trust in the process, the scientific process, right? Um, anthropology is supposed to be an unbiased uh, area of study and, and research. Um, and religion, and, and you know my, my uh, history with working with religion. Um, and I'll say that this, this lecture uh, came to me, Race in the Floating Signifier, it came to me after this residency, right? My, my focuses shift to looking for how we got to where we are. How did we end up here? Why are these things still happening? Um, so that uh, inspired an exhibition called True and Living. And uh, True and Living is a large professor song um, from the early 80s. Uh, but it also, you know, kind of using that title um, to describe a set of circumstances or a society that has this ghost that will not go away, right? This racism, this, this prejudice, this classism, this sexism. Uh, and so those those issues are very much true, they're very much real, and they're very much alive still today. And so that is the, the, the kind of inspiration behind the title True and Living. Um, what you see here uh, are, uh, is, is a book, and this is uh, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. What a lot of people don't know is that that book originally had a much longer title, and it is Charles Darwin on the origin of species or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And the, the second part of that title was eventually removed because scientists around the world were using their practice to prove that people of African descent were genetically less than. So you had scientists 
um, and biologists in Pennsylvania uh, with this massive collection of human skulls from all over the world. And they're filling these skulls with lead shot and then pouring that lead shot onto a scale and weighing it. And whichever skull held the most weight determined how, you know, how intelligent they were. And so this is kind of like a scientific method, a pseudoscientific method aimed specifically at proving that people of African descent are less intelligent and therefore deserve to be relegated to a second class citizenship. So this book becomes really important because a lot of authoritarian systems of power start using that word race to separate people from different places. And up until that point, the word race was synonymous with species. And so we all know that human beings are all the same species. There's no genetic difference between someone who is brown and someone who is black and someone who is white. There might be more genetic difference between two white people than there is between a white person and a black person. Um, and so that kind of study of these systems that are in place is what I'm most interested in at this point. Um, you also see uh, two hands holding up pickets and the pickets, uh, you know, the picket fence, the white picket fence becomes this symbol of class in my work. And that is rooted in a very specific story about an indentured servant named John Punch, uh, who was an indentured servant in the Virginia Commonwealth in 1620. And John Punch uh, is African. He escapes his servitude with a Scotsman and an Irishman. They are captured and brought back to the Commonwealth. The Scotsman and the Irishman are given three years of servitude to the family that they escaped from and one year of servitude to the Commonwealth. John Punch, the African, is given a sentence of lifelong servitude. This is some, it's, it's widely regarded as the first legal condoning of slavery in, the, in, in North America. Um, but more importantly, it very clearly illustrates a strategy. And it's a strategy that's still in place today. We saw it in in 2016 when Trump was being elected. And the strategy that I'm referring to is the eradication of a multi-race coalition. So what you had in the story of John Punch was an African, a Scotsman, and an Irishman who were in, who were in the same economic situation, banding together to find their freedom. These are three different races in the same economic situation, banding together to find their freedom. And when the Commonwealth, when the, when the powers that be, the wealthy white landowners saw this happening, they decided that they could gain the loyalty of poor whites if they gave them less severe punishments than they gave to poor blacks. And so they created what's called a multi-class coalition. So you saw the similar strategy when Trump, you know, kind of went out pandering to rural low income whites, promising jobs, and the return of coal and all these things, um, he's gaining the, the loyalty of poor whites when we all know that he has no interest in supporting anybody who's not a millionaire. So the picket fence becomes a really strong symbol in this, in this exhibition. Um, this piece is uh, titled Spectator Sport. And so what you have here is uh, a picket fence that has the Blue Lives Matter flag painted on it. I don't think too many people know that the Blue Lives Matter flag was uh, created in opposition to Black Lives Matter. It was, it's called a, a counter movement. Um, it was made to argue that, uh, that police lives are in danger and that we need to protect police. Um, you know, the people with the guns and the badges and the pepper spray and the tasers and the dogs uh, need, need protection from us. Um, and you have the, the police line, uh, do not cross tape. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to examine here is this, this kind of road sign crime scene where we rarely focus on the family on the other side of this tape, right? It's always about the police and the victim of the violence. And I think, uh, 
it is equally as important to understand the impact on the families of these victims, right? That what's missing from our society is, is empathy. And when you only see a victim and an aggressor, it, it happens, it kind of has this effect of breeding this polarized uh, world that we live in. But there are, there are so many people that are affected by these tragedies, entire families, children, uh, communities, community centers, schools, you know, these people all have uh, communities that they live and operate in, and, and those communities are affected too. Um, coincidentally, as I was making this sculpture, uh, you know, my, my initial goal was to embed figures into these picket fences, to use the picket fence as a mechanism itself of oppression. Uh, and so embedding the figure into these fences, uh, and this one in particular, I ended up uh, with this kind of cross. And it just so happens that it's in, it's made from the police tape that says do not cross. So you have the central kind of body of the figure running downward through the middle of the do not cross tape uh, with the hands perched on that, on that tape uh, to indicate someone looking in from the outside at the crime scene. Um, and when I noticed this cross being formed, uh, I, I started to remember the kind of role of the church uh, during the Reconstruction, during Jim Crow, and having um, you know KKK members in in the in the church on Sunday, and then those KKK members go to their job as a police officer on Monday, uh, and so all of these systems start to kind of coalesce in this body of work. Right? I'm talking about religion. I'm talking about police states, I'm talking about politics, I'm talking about all kinds of, of facets of society. Um, so these hands are kind of nailed to the, the police tape to reference the crucifixion, uh, the red pick that come down from the hands reference a priest's uh, stoles uh, in the garments that they would wear. Uh, and in the, on the ground here, I'll skip too far. Uh, on the ground here, you have a pair of sneakers that are resting in uh, recycled playground mulch. Um, and those sneakers, some will recognize as Nike Cortez. When I was growing up, uh, we referred to them as dope mans. And it was kind of like this strange symbol of blackness for me as a child. Uh, everybody I knew that was black had a pair of dope mans. And I always wanted a pair of dope mans, but uh, I never had one. And so when I finally got a pair of dope mans in high school, I remember putting them on and, and feeling afraid. I was, I was afraid that I was gonna be seen as an imposter or a poser because I didn't feel black enough to be wearing these shoes. Um, and so they became this kind of really uh, powerful symbol for me and, and a painful symbol for me, really. Uh, and so that's the story behind those particular sneakers. You'll notice that in each one of these sculptures, uh, the figure is cut off at the legs. And so again, I'm using the picket fence as a mechanism for oppression or for imprisonment or immobility. Um, you might think of uh, redlining, you know, you might think of um, what it, what it means, what a white neighborhood looks like, a, a wealthy white neighborhood, uh, and you would see these picket fences. Um, this piece here is titled Rope or Dope, uh, obviously rope referring to the history of lynching, um, dope referring to the war on drugs. Uh, so it's taken from Ali's kind of classic strategy of the rope-a-dope, where he would lean against the ropes in a boxing match uh, while his opponent tired themselves out. Um, before he went on the attack. And so I think rope or dope uh, is a really amazing metaphor for uh, the endurance of black people throughout history and kind of still in the fight, but also waiting patiently for our opponents to tire themselves out. You know, we're, we, it's, it's this two pronged approach, right? We have to be active, but we also have to, you know, these, the, uh, the powers that be also have to somehow change and realize the error of their ways. Um, and so I modeled this, this picket fence out of a boxing ring. Um, my father grew up with Cassius Clay in, in Louisville, Kentucky before uh, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. 
So there's some kind of familial ties to this story. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a figure kneeling uh, on its knees with its feet face up, uh, hands interlaced uh, on the back of its head. So it's in the position of being uh, detained by police. Um, and then the AstroTurf, uh, you know, referencing the football field, right? So we have this kneeling figure on its knees uh, being obtained by police, but it also directly references Colin Kaepernick taking a knee. And so these, these sculptures are, they're a little difficult to talk about because there's so much that goes into them. But I find that once I start digging into popular culture and history and science and religion and politics and anthropology, all of these issues that I'm talking about are so interwoven and so deeply connected that it's almost impossible not to address all of them simultaneously. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to look at the whole picture to understand how we got to where we are now. Um, this piece here is titled Home Away From Home, uh, referencing mass incarceration. Uh, here you have the figure uh, gripping the prison bars um, the area rug of a living room, um, you know, it, disproportionately we find Native, Hispanic, uh, Latino, Chicano, and Black uh, people imprisoned more so than whites. Um, we find harsher punishments. We find people living out their lives in prison cells because they can't afford bail. Um, so, uh, you know, another, yet another kind of authoritarian facet of our contemporary society is um, mass incarceration. Um, this piece here is titled The Pieta, and um, it really was made because I had a bunch of extra pickets after making these sculptures, but uh, I was trying to figure out what to do with them. Um, and I, I decided I was gonna make this American flag out of these fence pickets. Um, and, and a lot of things kind of changed and shifted as I was working on it, but um, I started thinking about, well, what flag is it going to be? You know, uh, what flags are there that, that I want to examine? And so this, this flag in particular uh, is the 36 star flag, which is also called the Lincoln flag. It's the flag that Lincoln's head rested upon after he was shot. Um, it's the flag that was in place when the 13th Amendment was passed. The 13th Amendment being the amendment that, um, you know, kind of abolished slavery, right? It, it, it was supposed to abolish slavery, but we know that that was followed by a uh, hundred years of uh, Jim Crow and reconstruction. We know that it's since been followed by mass incarceration and the war on drugs, uh, all of which are described by Michelle Alexander as the new Jim Crow. Um, and so this, this piece really talks about the failure of that ideal. It talks about the failure of um, the 13th Amendment but it also talks about the failure of the church during the reconstruction. So that title, the Pieta is very specific. Um, and so the reason it has that title is because as I was thinking about these flags and, and what flags I wanted to examine, um, I, I came across the Pan-African flag. Uh, and it's, you know, it's something that I've been well aware of for a long time. Uh, um, David, um, uh, Hammond made his uh, Pan-African flag piece, but um, this flag in particular was created during the civil rights uh, era. And it is hanging from a coat hook um, draped on the American flag. And it is laying in the pose of Jesus when he was taken down from the cross and laid in the lap of, the, of, of Mary. Um, and so all you art historians out there might know uh, Michelangelo's Pieta, um, and this pose is, is resembling of Christ in the lap of Mary. What people may not know is that the Pieta is carved out of Carrara marble, and it was quarried in Tuscany by prisoners. It was quarried by prisoners who um, were forced into labor under the most harsh conditions. A lot of those prisoners died quarrying the marble for that sculpture, that sculpture commissioned by, um, you know, a religious family and paid for by the church. Uh, so again, I'm trying to make connections between um, 
past and present, um, but also all of these different kind of systems of power and religion being one of those. Um, in this exhibition, uh, there were also a series of paintings and these paintings are really meant to address the more personal side of my experiences. Uh, these paintings are uh, completed on the pages of a coloring book called Around the Seasons. Um, and this coloring book is, is full of images of white children uh, engaging in kind of mundane activities, but through these activities, they're learning about color. And uh, it was originally printed on white paper uh, due to the unarchival unarchival quality of the paper, it has yellowed over time and the, the color now resembles my skin tone. Uh, so what I'm doing here is using the binary of black and white, uh, the binary of my, um, you know, kind of ethnic makeup, my black father, my white mother, uh, and I'm strategically covering or exposing parts of the coloring book uh, to create poems or conundrums or puzzles, um, uh, or even just commentary on social, cultural, political issues. Um, and so on each page, the image has the, the, you know, an image and then under the image is a narrative. And if you read the narrative, it tells you how to color the page. And so I've altered that kind of in the spirit of blackout poetry. Um, so this one is, is about uh, the man in the moon. Uh, and it says, is he really a man, question mark, no, he is not, period. Uh, all these paintings are framed in uh, custom-made frames that are meant to resemble colonial style windows. So again, kind of referring back to uh, 1620 and the story of John Punch, uh, colonialism and, and the Virginia Commonwealth. Um, you will see that there's kind of a thick raised pattern on these paintings and that, um, is a patterning from what's called uh, uh, cruel work, colonial cruel work, and it's an embroidery technique uh, and patterning that was directly, well, essentially stolen from uh, East Asian countries uh, by colonial settlers, and they started to reproduce these uh, textiles and sell them at an enormous profit. So this one says gray, gray, gray and you're looking at a white landscape with a black sky, uh, kind of forced to understand what happens if those two things collide. Um, this piece ruffles feathers a little bit. Um, it says, stay away from his heels, he is learning to kick. And so, you know, the kind of tongue in cheek uh, or, or sarcastic voice in my head um, is saying, you know, y'all better watch out we're learning to kick and, 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 you know, you can't get away with this shit for much longer. Um, but the other side of me is, is asking the viewer kind of a difficult question. Uh, and it's a silly question, but it's a difficult question because a lot of people get offended. White people in particular, they say, well, are you saying that white people are pigs? And in that moment, I have to ask them if they would rather be a donkey. And so there's kind of this like, jab at, at um, you know, there, like, this shouldn't be so polarized, right? Blackness is many things. Whiteness is many things. And, and so just because you bring these preconceived notions to this painting uh, doesn't mean that's what I mean. And I'm not absolving myself of any responsibility here. I'm very aware that I'm poking the bear on this one. Um, but I have to have fun sometimes, right? Um, I do want to comment on the pattern here. This is the, the, the raised pattern and this one is a traditional kente cloth pattern. Um, during kind of all my research, uh, my father uh, had a genealogy test done and, and found out that 78% of his bloodline comes from Ghana and the Congo. And I don't know how many people have in this Zoom lecture have um, had one of these kind of 23andMe or Ancestry.com tests done, but 78% is a massive number. And so that means a lot of things for me. It means one, that very recently, my ancestors uh, were probably stolen from their land. Uh, it means that 
very recently, uh, my direct descendants were living in Africa. Um, and it means that I have maybe for the first time ever concrete proof of a community that I belong to or a place that I come from or some semblance of an identity that I never had before. And, and so these paintings uh, became really uh, kind of like emotional for me. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, they're, they're very important paintings to me. And so this exhibition is really meant to do a lot of things. And, and it's, you know, it's meant to describe my lived experiences, my revelations, my understanding of who I am. But it's also meant to call into question um, all of these things that we think we know, the, the, the books that we read in school, the, the church that we go to, you know, all of it uh, has been given to us in a certain fashion. And there's so much that isn't being taught. And I firmly believe that if people know about these things, then they develop a sense of empathy. And if it happens at an early age, um, you, can, you can prevent this kind of polarized world that we live in because you know, people know the truth. And so what I'm trying to do is, is offer the truth uh, with this work. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is a, a picture of my studio table. Um, I usually end with uh, a more upbeat note on some stupid collages that I make, just so you guys don't go home depressed or, or frustrated. But uh, I think I've been talking too much, so I'll kind of open it up for questions or comments. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll keep sharing my screen in case anybody has something specific they wanna look at. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um... There's a lot to talk about, and I want to open it up for questions first. I have a couple questions, but if anyone in the audience wants to type something in the chat um, for Aaron, uh, now is the time. Oh, you know what? Maybe I have to stop sharing my screen to see the chat. Do I? Uh, you might, uh, I'm not sure. I can read it if you want. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, if I need to pull something back up, I will. Okay. <clears throat> Sylvia said, I have to leave now. Great talk. Thank you. That's not a question, Sylvia. <laughs> I'll get us kick, get sort of kicked off. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting <clears throat> about the work is this, um, this the sort of didacticism of it and not in with the any of the sort of derogatory terms in that like it's very much sort of geared towards teaching a little bit um and i sort of wonder do you like how how you sort of came to that and I'll, i guess do you feel a responsibility to do that in your work and I guess sort of side note like do you feel like that's very much connected to just the fact that you are an educator yeah I mean there's yes yes and yes and yes um I think well first of all I think I make different kinds of work for different purposes so some of the work is very direct and then some of the work is much more coded and poetic or um, imagine, you know, it's my imagination. Um, and I do that on purpose. I, you know, sometimes I'm really pissed off and I just want to say what I want to say. And sometimes I don't know what to say and I'm trying to explain that. Um, so, you know, that, that man in the moon painting, uh, for some people is very straightforward. Um, and for some people it's less so, but um, there are other paintings in that series that just describe four different kinds of leaves. Mm -hmm. And it says one is yellow, one is red, one is brown, one is purple. And, you know, those are all skin tones that people have referred to blackness as. Um, and so when you look at that painting, it looks like a painting of leaves. And it's, pr it's pretty and simple, um, but it has a lot of personal undertones in it for me. Um, you know, as far as uh, the educational standpoint, 
I find myself in a unique position. Um, I, first of all, I have the luxury of being at a research institution. So I have time to read. I have time to, to dig and search and learn things that we've never known or that I was never taught or that the public was never taught. Um, but I'm, I'm in a position of, um, it's a very difficult position as a biracial person, but I'm also, I'm also afforded some uh, privileges for my lighter skin tone, right? So I can have conversations with white people in a way that maybe someone who is black cannot. I can have conversations with black people in a way that maybe someone who is white cannot. And I'm not saying that I'm the best of both worlds or invincible because I get it wrong. And I say, I say the wrong thing, I do the wrong thing. I mean, I'm st I'll be the first to admit that I'm still learning about how to be a human. You know, I don't think we ever stop. Um, but what I really hope happens is that I can open the door by, by talking about systems that we already know, um, using images that we already have access to and my kind of unique position, my hope is that I can open a, a conversation and then tell somebody the history that I've uncovered, tell somebody the story uh, of where this sculpture comes from. Cause we take art history classes. No one ever tells us that the Pieta was quarried by prisoners who died doing, doing the labor. They don't talk about that. And so, you know, in part it's because we don't want to know that shit. Uh, some people don't want to hear the truth, but I also think that a lot of people just don't know, you know? And so I want to educate people um, so that they have a full understanding of what they're dealing with, not to change their mind, not to tell them that what they know is wrong. It's never like a, an attack. It's a, um, it's an offering, I guess I would say. I don't know how many people take it that way, but um, I tell you right now, the Blue Lives Matter flag it did not go over well. Uh, there were some people who were very pissed. There were there were people at the exhibition opening. One lady came up to me and said, um, "She she just said, just so you know, I'm former police." <laughs> she didn't say, "Hey, I used to be a police officer." She said, "I am former police." So when you say like "I am police," you are not just saying I'm a police officer. You're saying I am a part of this ethos. I am a part of this way of seeing the world. I'm a way, I'm, I'm part of this way of life. You know, so like, I was terrified. I was like, oh shit. Uh, so yeah, you know, I wasn't about to try to educate her uh, because she was not ready to be, she wasn't ready to have a conversation. So anyways, if you let me keep going, I'll just keep rambling. I mean, I think <clears throat> no one's asking questions, so I'll ask one more before we go and see if it elicits anything. I mean, I think some of what you were saying sort of leads and is connected to another one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of like, you know, this idea of like coding, right? Coding the work and the codes that are in the work and the way that we use codes in our work and, and making work that is like for your community so like, for example, the shoes and the one piece, like I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know anything about that. Like, I don't have that. But I mean, in my work, I also use coded imagery or, or materials that very like pointedly speak to a queer community. So like, I understand that um, sort of MO. Um, <clears throat> but I also think this idea of like, the, like how it works sort of in some ways, um, antithetically to the, the didactic part of the work to use coding that is specific for, for a specific community and like how, how, how you sort of incorporate clues that allow someone who's not part of that specific community to unpack some of the meaning. Um, I don't know if that's really a question more than just like a, an observation about the work that I think you're really good at, you know? Well, I appreciate that. Um, it's, it all comes back to, uh, you know, I have to work through these issues through several avenues. 
you know, um, first of all, I'm working, I'm working through my response to atrocities, historical and current. Um, I'm working through trying to understand um, uh, why things are happening, but I'm also, I'm also wrestling with my own personal um, uh, life, you know, and who I am. And, and, you know, one thing that I have to think about all the time is who am I disappointing and who am I offending? And both of those questions are, are kind of two pronged, right? Like, am I expected by the white community to make work about race because I am brown? And if I don't, am I gonna disappoint them? If I make work about these issues, am I gonna offend white people? But more importantly is it, when I'm making this work, am I crossing a line for my own community? Am I um, subjecting my community to uh, trauma that they've already been subjected to for eons, you know? And so part of, part of that kind of coding, part of inserting um, pieces of the culture that are only understand if you've kind of excavated that culture is my way of saying like, I'm here, I understand, I've been through these things. I've experienced racism my entire life. You know what I mean? I never knew how to process it. Um, but, you know, those sneakers, the dope mans, um, it, was, it was immediate. Every black person that was at that exhibition was like, oh shit, you got dope mans in there. Those are clean, you know? And like, they were brand new. I bought them specifically for that piece because I wanted them to be as white as they were uh, on the feet of my friends growing up because they clean those sneakers religiously with mm. toothbrushes and shit. You know what I mean? Um, the, the dude at uh, the, the preparator at the museum, that was at the Mesa Museum of Contemporary Art, he texted me every day, like, yo, the sneakers are still there. No one took them yet. <laughs> so like people got it, you know what I mean? But other people, um, other people just saw them as a stand in for a person. You know, they saw them as like, uh, as, as the feet of a figure, which is also fine. Um, so I tried to, I remember talking to my wife about the sculptures when I was making them and I was telling her everything that I told you guys about the sculptures. And she was like, Aaron, no one is going to get all that. No one is going to pull all that out of each one of these. And I don't expect them to, I really don't. You know, I, if you, if you look at that boxing ring and you think of Hurricane Carter and not Muhammad Ali, I'm fine with that. If you look at that sculpture and you, and you're confused as to why there's astroturf in a boxing ring that's also like some that's that's a level of abstraction that i'm willing to let people wrestle with um so you know it's 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 all about me trying to process these things in different ways through through the current events through the newspapers through my familial history through things that i've lived through um through stories i've heard you know uh all all those kinds of things so you know, I, I, I really, um, at the root, what I don't want to do is re-illustrate trauma. I don't want to just reproduce trauma. So I find that it's interesting because I think a lot of the coding that you're talking about comes from my personal experience, right? So like there's, if I split it into two, there's the political and the personal. And I'm not saying that the two don't coincide or mix or, or whatever, but, um, the coded language, the coded objects or imagery usually come from personal experiences. And I think that's just part of like what it means to work through personal trauma uh, through imagery or objects, right? Like how do you represent something like that? And it's usually through very specific things like sneakers, a pair of sneakers that I had this terrible experience with, um, you know, and so, the political is maybe the more recognizable uh, facade of some of the work. But then if you spend enough time with it, you start to like, no, no one ever thought about the actual pattern on the carpet of that one sculpture, but that pattern is very specific to colonial cruel work. And so there is, a, there, I, I do, 
I feel like I'm, I'm asking a lot of the viewer, but I also feel like that's okay. Yeah. And it's totally, I mean, I think it's, the work is accessible. So I want to um, uh, just recognize that Keith asked, um, thanked you and asked if you're familiar with Jamar Tisby's The Color of Compromise. I am not. Book, um, but everybody note that. Um, so thanks for that, Keith. Yeah, um, I do, this is being recorded, correct? Yeah. So I will, I'll just like run down a quick reading list if anybody's curious. Um, stamped from the beginning, the definitive history of racist ideas in America is an unbelievable book. Um, you guys may know Ibram Kendi, uh, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, most recently like shot to the top of the New York Times list and is kind of like the book that everybody's looking to, to, to save our lives. But the precursor to that is stamped from the beginning and it's, it's earth shattering material. Um, the New Jim Crow, uh, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander is another just unbelievable resource. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, um, Sadia Hartman's uh, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. Uh, it, it's about um, the kind of rebellious, uh, nature of black women from I think like 1830 to 1940 uh, especially in New York and it talks about the power in um, in their in their existence uh, it's an amazing book um, yeah I'll, I'll leave it at that there's a lot there's a lot of stuff out there that um, really informs a lot of what I do but uh, those three books have been kind of instrumental yeah, thanks. I mean, <clears throat> I think, yeah, there's a lot. And I, you know, Aaron, I just want to say, like, thank you for being so generous and, like, also, like, um, transparent with, like, the things that you're thinking about and the way that you're thinking about things and sort of your own struggles with them. Because I think, um, you know, as we move through this sort of, like, our contemporary situation, that kind of openness and transparentness and and willing to see ourselves as like vulnerable and mistake prone or whatever is like so important and i think your work is so generous in its um honesty i think and the you know we talk about the codes and i think there's this stuff about you know, speaking not just to your community, but also to your generation or, you know, your specific lived experience, like very specific lived experience. But I also think there's so much in there that is available to anyone. I mean, anyone who maybe hasn't been like living under a rock for the last decade. Yeah. yeah. And so, <clears throat> you know, before we finish, I just want to say thank you again and ask, like, I'll just, I'll try and be quiet for like 10 seconds to see if anyone else has a question. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer one comment uh, while, if any questions come in. Um, I'll just say like the most, one of the most painful things for me in the last year, um, I mean, it, yes, it's, it is seriously painful to see black death. It's seriously painful to see white racists. But one thing that's really painful is to see people who are trying, people who are trying to learn, people who are trying to change, trying to understand. Uh, and, and, and when they screw up, they just get pummeled. And I just, I just can't, it just eats me alive. So I just wanna remind everybody, not that you need reminding, but we're all learning all the time. It doesn't stop. We're all learning. And, you know, I'm learning how to be patient with with white folks. White folks are learning how to not put their foot in their mouth. You know, we're all learning something that is not easy to learn. And, and so I'll just say, like, um, uh, Viola Davis says, um, she says, be kind to yourself and to those traveling in the same direction. Yeah. And so just remember that like, if, you know, we're gonna fuck up. We're gonna do dumb shit. And, and if we can just like pick each other back up and keep each other moving down the right path, then it's just gonna be a lot better in the end than 
mm-hmm. than um, ridiculing people for making mistakes. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Hey, um, at first off, this this was awesome. Uh, but I had, I had a question actually. Um, throughout this this whole presentation, there's this beautiful string of um, appropriation, which is is great to see a positive connotation to the word appropriation, uh, which I love. But you know, you talked about hip hop taking samples and things like that. And I really loved the, uh, the two pieces like in the middle where you talked about, you know, you were kind of expressing an atrocity that happened to someone that's kind of other than you. And I thought that was really like such an interesting thing to see you almost empathetically appropriating like someone else's feelings, uh, you know, and, and like, you know, maybe you weren't putting your guts into that art like your, your professor had said but you almost like really beautifully felt that person's thing and expressed that in your art. And I wonder if you ever find yourself kind of going back to that uh, now that it seems like you're like so entrenched uh, in, into your own things, which is also beautiful to see. Yeah, first of all, um, I just thank you so much for that question because I had never, I had never considered what it meant to kind of like appropriate someone else's experience. Um, so that's like a, that's a really challenging idea to, for me to think about and wrestle with. Um, and not that it's bad or good. I mean, I'm assuming it could go really bad, really fast, but um, that's just a really interesting way to think about that, that I've never heard. Um, um, I will say that the more I make, the more I realize how many people are out there that have the same experiences that I do, you know, or similar experiences and how me speaking about my own personal experiences not only helps other people who have had the same experiences deal with that or, or feel connected to somebody, but it also helps people who are feeling oppressed or, um, you know, oppressed in a different way. Right. So um, I think the difference is, is um, rather than rather than talking about someone's experiences or struggles to to illustrate a point that something's wrong with this particular system, I'm only pointing the camera inward. Right. I'm, I'm focusing on my own experiences. And I think there's a shared kind of collective resilience there. I think that's something that having a having a black mentor early on would have changed the entire landscape for me right it would have let me know that by talking about my own struggles i'm talking about struggles for other people and i just didn't have that and and i'm not blaming anybody you know maybe it's maybe it is like i just wasn't mature enough or develop i mean i was just like running around painting my name on shit but um you know it it actually it really took uh, when I got to the University of Arizona, the, the, the students that I had were so deeply connected to who they were. And I think that's like, I, I do think in part that's a generational thing. I think this, this generation of young people, are they know who they are. They're not fucking around. You know what I mean? And it, in part, it's because of so many people that have come before them and paved a path. But also, they are just fearless. And um, so when I got to the University of Arizona, um, you know, it wasn't long after grad school that I got there. The the students that I was interacting with, I kind of owe a lot to because they they showed me what it was to have these conversations. They really showed me like what it was to dig inside myself more. And in a way that's like, it's embarrassing that I, I got so far without having to really do that. I mean, I did it. I did it, but I didn't really do it. Um, and maybe it's also just me growing up and living in this world and hitting, hitting a point at the same time that I, I encountered these students. I was hitting a boiling point with everything that's going on in the world. So maybe it's like all of the things coming together. But long, long story short, I realized that when I talk about my experiences, my students understood 
they responded, they connected, they felt um, empowered by having a professor who was talking about these issues. They wanted to, they wanted to be there. They wanted to talk about it. They wanted to hear it. And so it just, it was like a mix of all those things. But so in a way, I feel like um, in being more honest and, and speaking from my own point of view, I, I kind of am taking care of other people as well. Uh, the way that I was trying to when I was talking about other people's experiences, but maybe more in a more authentic and real way now. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. It's like, it's, you know, we never want to compare oppressions, right? But we can recognize intersectionality and that's so important. Absolutely. So um, thank you again, Aaron. Um, I would love it if everyone just turned off their, um, their microphone or turned on their microphones for a second and gave Aaron a um, round of applause for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And and everybody, this um, this will be available. Um, on, I've been trying to get them out at least the week after. I think I'm a little bit behind on last week's, um, but they will be posted um, to the archive for the CCA at CCA page. And Aaron, I'll I'll send you a link to that if you want to share it around when it's done. Um, and I'll and I'll send you a follow up email probably anyway. So. Thanks again, everybody who came and we're doing another talk next week. So look out for that. Um, and again, Aaron, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's cool to see your face. Yeah, it's good to see you too. And thanks everybody for taking the time to listen. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks everyone. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Appreciate it.